Welcome back to the Order of Chaos podcast. Today, my guest is David Shoemaker. David is the author of Living Thelema, which is a wonderful guide to the practices of Thelemic magic and to the magic of Alistair Crowley. Um, and if you're like me and you find Crowley's work to be daunting and hard to understand, uh, overwhelming, or seeming like it's just too much for you, I highly recommend this book. It, it boils things down in a way that makes it understandable to maybe the average occultist or someone who, if you're like me and you have ADHD and you struggle with, with uh, structured systems, this really makes it a lot easier. Uh, David also is also a practicing psychologist and specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy and Jungian psychology. David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited for this. And of course, uh, as usual, I want to give a big shout out to Wiser Books for setting this interview up, making it possible. Uh, I can't say how much I appreciate them and all the great authors that they send my way. So if it's okay with you, David, um, I would like to skip over some of the basic questions that you probably encounter a lot of the time, like what is the Lema and, you know, the basics and jump into some of the more specifics and um and, and more interesting areas of this, this realm of esotericism, as I have yeah. a lot of questions that I would like answered for my own personal self. And I'm just hoping my listeners will be able to follow along and, and get the same benefit from my, that I do. Sounds great. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thalema, Alistair Crowley. The first thing I, I would say about this is that I've always struggled with really structured magical systems. I've always been deeply interested in magic since I was 14 years old uh, up until the present day, and it's only become more and more of an obsession. But when I look at some of Crowley's books or the Thoth Tarot and the complexity of those systems, I just go, oh my gosh, uh, that's a lot. It gives me a headache right away. But your book I found to be fantastic because it, like I said, it boils a lot of that down into a way that's a, a, a system that's easier to understand one thing though that really gets me is that if you're studying thalema if you're looking into thalema i should say you will find so many contradictory opinions and these people are are rock solid in their contradictory opinions so when i was reading through your book i had a, like a my neighbors probably heard me laughing because i i laughed out loud so hard um i think it's one of the first chapters when you're talking about the holy guardian angel and you say that the, like the first line is that the holy guardian angel is akin to what's also known as the higher self now that sentence right there could trigger a whole lot of people because <laughs> i've had other people on this show say that's absolutely not what it is right so yeah um, that's a great yeah, yeah. that's a great point <clears throat> and 
<clears throat> Excuse me. That's a great point, and, and it's um, really is one of the central um, points of argument for the the entire system of Philema. Uh, to be fair to myself, I, I was indicating that uh, what I was trying to indicate in that chapter is that um, there are a lot of different ways that the HGA is talked about and thought about. Um, there is a school of thought, including Crowley's own words um, at certain points in his career, that the HGA was like the higher self, like a, an aspect of self, a higher you know function of the psyche, um, akin to the the Kabbalistic Neshama or something like that. Um, but at other places and other points, he talks about the HGA clearly as an external entity. And um, I am not actually making a, a a doctrinal statement about what it is. What I what I'd like to do is have people know that if you pursue the system and get to the place where you are ripened for knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, you'll have all the answers you need about what it actually is to you. And uh, so I, I'm. I, and I think sometimes in my efforts to give a lot of broad possibilities, it may even sound like I'm trying to pin it down more than I am. Uh, so I, I, I might not have to argue too aggressively with anyone who says it's definitely not the higher <laughs> self, because it's, uh, you know, I, I know what it is to me. Uh, and, and my experience, quite frankly, was beyond anything I could conceive of as an aspect of self. Uh, so... I, I, if anything, I fall more on that side of the fence. I agree. I agree and I disagree at the same time. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, but it, actually, before that, let me go to my next question because you, you've touched on it a little bit already. Now, do you, mm -hmm. as a, uh, you've, been, you've been a lifelong, essentially, practitioner uh, of these. All my adult life, just, yeah. Yeah, your adult life. Uh, and I know that you're involved with not only the the AA, you are a uh, chancellor in, it is, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the name wrong, so I'm going to read it right here, um, the Temple of the Silver Star. Correct. Now, yes. are these, um, these aren't strictly Thelemic organizations or organizations that incorporate the teachings of Thelema into their own framework. Is that accurate? Well, the AA is, uh, is the, the extension of the organization that Alan <laughs> Crowley founded, of course. But the uh, Temple of the Silver Star is a Thelemic order um, pattern on the Golden Dawn. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a hybrid of uh, you know some of the landmarks of the Golden Dawn cipher manuscripts and that kind of Tree of Life degree structure, but um, incorporating the wide array of Thelemic practices and, and doctrines. Okay, so. Okay, next question. Within this practice, do you personally, two part question, you personally, and let's say, um, I don't want you to speak for other people, but as a general understanding, are the practices of the AA Golden Dawn Philema thought to be objective facts about the spirit realm or a set of metaphors with which one can use to access the spirit realm? Mm -hmm. Which of these is more accurate? That's a great question. Um, I think there are landmarks, milestones of personal spiritual progress that, while entirely unique to each, each individual, can kind of map out in ways that are somewhat predictable. So you could build a system with some tools in it that would help someone who's an entirely different kind of person attain just as it would someone else you know um so i think there is an objective ladder you know that's that's built in to the human psycho spiritual uh, apparatus whatever you want to call it um that that allows us to create systems of, of initiation but um ultimately i think we can't get away from the truth that since each person has their own subjective experience of what the color green is, much less something really complex like uh, the magical path, uh, I don't see what we can argue that there's um, not a great deal of uh, metaphor and mapping, you know, going on with these systems so that we don't confuse the terrain for the map, you know, as they say. I, I do. And I think that that was a really brilliant response. Um, 
I'm a little blown away. That's fantastic. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take this opportunity now because I forgot to in the beginning to shamelessly plug my own system of initiation. <laughs> So uh, there will be a second class date starting for the Order of Chaos Mystery School. So if you are interested and you missed the first class startup uh, back in January, there is a new class starting on June 4th. Uh, all the information is on my website and will be linked down below. Now, back to the interview. So great response, uh, because this is one of the things that has irked me a little bit about particular magical systems is that I don't... Through my understanding of occult fundamentals, which I would say begins with the teachings that are within the Kabbalion, I wouldn't say that it starts with the Kabbalion as a book, but with the Hermetic principles, that's where I believe so many um, occult traditions uh, spring out of, is that even if it's not from a particular writer, but from the understanding of things like as above, so below, as within, so without. Right. That, that seems to be almost universal throughout Western occultism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And through those understandings, it, it seems to me that these things must have a degree of subjectivity to them. While at the same time, now I'm currently involved in um, a, uh, a book that I'm, I'm working on with Peter J. Carroll, who is the uh, founder of Chaos Magic. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he and I disagree about a number of things, one of which is the use of astrology. I look at astrology and I see objectivity. I, I see a way to to see a person's blueprint, essentially. And um, because I, I do this for my students, for my clients, I, I've probably given about a thousand astrology readings. I've never once seen a chart where it's like, nope, this doesn't make sense, doesn't add up, that, mm. that's not real. And that has not happened one single time. So while I, I see that there's a degree of objectivity to what we're, we're doing in occultism, there's also this, this wild degree of subjectivity about how you view it and what symbols interact with you in particular ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so within the, the framework of Thelema, of the Golden Dawn, is there any room for interpretation or is the strictness of the system there to ensure your progress? The, the strictness in the system is there to make sure that uh, certain tools and skills are adequately trained at certain stages. Um, but what each individual does with those tools and the personal mysteries that they uncover with those tools, no one could possibly predict for them, you know, uh, but when we, to give some examples, uh, when we're training someone on uh, the use of the body of light, the, the tools for astral projection or scrying or things like that, um, or if we're testing people on their yoga, uh, testing postures, testing for pranayama uh, results and so on, those are, those are building blocks, but, and, and landmarks that need to be tested, I think, for this particular approach, um, but within that, it's a huge. There's a huge openness to each individual's, uh, you know, their own findings and their own, certainly their own philosophical or religious interpretations of things. We don't meddle with at all. Um, we present tools that have been tested in good faith, and we encourage people to try them. And we do our best to, to test them to make sure that they're getting it, you know, along the way. But that's just the tools. And then the meat of it is always going to be what, what each individual discovers. Man, you're making uh, these practices far more appealing than they ever have been to me in the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've well, always uh, found that there's a rigidity to people who I'm talking to about these systems that, that you don't mm -hmm. seem to have. And I think that that's fantastic. Um, I had a guest previously on the show who, and it was a wonderful conversation. Um, but, you know, he, through his, um, own experimentation and, and, um, and working through the Abramelin ritual in order to achieve the knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel, he came to the conclusion that these are objective facts. Cool. And I, I just, I just don't know what yeah. to make of that. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was hard guess, for me. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'd have to hear more about which facts are facts, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Certain, certain, there may be facts of, uh, 
like I said, landmarks of progress, things that tend to happen repeatedly and reliably enough that we can say, here's the stage everyone tends to go through or most people tend to go through. But that still would only apply to this particular path. You know, there, you could pick some other organization training in an entirely different way that has virtually no overlap in the tool sets, but still helping people attain, you know. So I, I think to get too dogmatic about any particular path or system is uh, an error. I agree. Um, now, back to what I was saying before, um, mm -hmm. when we're talking about the Holy Guardian Angel and its relationship to the higher self, and the sort of argument that if you spend any amount of time online talking about esotericism, you'll run into is the is this a, a part of the self? Or is right. this something external of you? Now, my answer to that has always been uh, and this is one of the foundational teachings of my own mystery school is that there is no difference there. There is very little difference there. That is to say that through the understanding of as above, so below, as within, so without, there is no external world of you. The external world is a creation of your mind, which is also what neuroscience tells us that while there is an external world, it's not this cartoon that you and I are currently experiencing, that is a creation of the mind. It's an interpretation of the external world, and it can only create that interpretation through what is already within you. Sure. However, <laughs> through my own experience with magic and through working with magic and working with the deities, I have manifested things into my life that I thought were otherwise impossible. So there, you're sure. accessing, if it is, let's say it is a part of you, it is a much more powerful part of you than you normally have access to without going through these steps without uh attempting this magic yeah yeah um uh, my friend on duquette likes to say uh, that uh yes it's all in your head but you just don't know how big your head is and yes. i think we're getting at similar ideas here that the you know there's uh an all-encompassing mind with the capital m that we that we partake of but also are embedded in you know in, in the universe and that helps us do the magic to begin with um yeah i thought i had another comment on that but i don't <laughs> <laughs> no i know and you know these are this is what i was saying these are heavy topics and it's it's easy to yeah. to get a little bit lost in them so i will try to keep us on track but I, i've been very excited for this conversation because again i just have so many questions um so right jump in right in the next one and i have a, a little anecdote here as well um now we've talked a little bit about what the holy guardian angel is now from your perspective mm -hmm. what are angels and what we know as demons mm -hmm. Um, in a way, I guess it's the same answer, um, because clearly there are repeatable patterns, trends in people's experiences with certain entities that might lead credence to the idea that there are characteristics of a certain entity that show up from person to person. So it's not entirely a subjective thing. Um, you could also argue that some of that is front loading based on something they might have uh, encountered as a description of what they were supposed to experience, but you, you always have to be cautious of that anyway. Um, so, so there may be tendencies that a certain angel or archangel or spirit or whatever will embody certain characteristics as it appears to the practitioner, but uh, certainly it's through their own lens, their own psyche, their own predispositions in terms of perception and uh, the way they kind of approach and understand interacting with anything in their lives. So there's some projection of their, their own personality and their own character there. Um, I just think that the, the, the primary distinction with the HGA, to say another word on that in connection with this, is, and this is one reason why it seems so inner and so outer at the same time, or can, that it's so personal. The, the experience of the HGA is so personal so specific to who we are and who we've always been and our basic nature or true will that it seems impossible that it could be out there because it's so it explains so much about who we are but at the same mm -hmm. time the experience is so phenomenally beyond uh anything we've ever felt as an individual of ourselves any any experience of oh this that's that part of me that thinks this way or that's that uh, creative part of me or whatever 
it's so beyond that and so seemingly external that it's it's impossible to to feel comfortable saying oh it's, this is just you know an interior aspect um but I, I, that's the essential value of the hga experience in many ways that it opens us up to understanding who we are in a, in a deeper way than we ever could have without it and everything we you know all our our uh, preferences and our talents and our predispositions are used uh, to enact our true will are employed by the angel to get us to do our job here on earth, you know, but um, it's also experientially so much beyond any, any tool or any predisposition or any aspect of personality or talent or whatever uh, that you know, it, it, the only answer to this dilemma is to go through it and, and see, you know, how how it manifests for each individual. Absolutely. Um, yes, I agree. Now, I want to, so I, I want to state here that, and I'm sure I'm, I'm just, I'm ready for the comments, people. Bring them at me. It's fine. Um, having never before studied much of Crowley beyond a few quotes. Let's just leave it just, just that. Mm -hmm. I, but having gone through many, 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 many years of other magical systems around five years ago, I had a confrontation with what I would call my HGA, as I understand mm -hmm. it through now understanding um, as much as I do understand about Crowley's work. Um, and it was life-changing absolutely life-changing and it's the reason i'm doing everything that i'm doing now it's the reason I, I have a school it's the reason i have a podcast it's the reason i do any anything in my life essentially it was that profound and yet i didn't go through, through a single one of the rituals that i was supposed to in order to achieve that it happened quite by accident and was in fact terrifying um the the first I mean, so if i remember correctly it began to happen one time and i jumped out of my chair and i said no and then I and I spent another year reworking it until the point where it was a yes and we got there and I was ready for it. Um, but I, but as you're saying, like it, it was so profound that it I, I can't explain it to anybody. You can't explain this to people. It, it, you have to experience it. Now, my question is, because this was my experience, um, yeah. what I was told in this conversation aligns precisely with my with what so in astrology and i practice western tropical astrology using whole sign houses and i know everyone's got their opinions about astrology and we're not gonna we're not gonna do that people okay <laughs> that's a, that'd be 10 more episodes but from my point of view you can actually glimpse at least glimpse a person's true will through their north node placement and through i use chaldean numerology i know there's chaldean there's pythagorean there's dramatria I think that they're all quite similar little tweaks and nuance. I, I tend to use Chaldean, but I believe that through astrology, you can glimpse a person's true will in their North node placement, sort of uh, triangulated with their, um, with their destiny number and their life path number as being the way in which they will get there. And this is a concept I call the arrow of destiny. And because mine lines up precisely with what I was told in this conversation, I'm, my question is, is that mm -hmm. typical? It, it, are communications with the HGA typically relevant to the true will of a person? Is that the question? Well, are they relevant to, do they, do they coincide with, or have you seen them override like uh, another system used to sort of derive the same information like astrology oh, or I numerology? See. Okay. I see. Okay. Um, in, in my experience and in the experience of those I've talked to about their experience, of the HGA, um, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say all those ways I was thinking about myself and conceiving of myself were wrong. Like I did my natal chart and now it just seems like that's totally off and what the HGA told me is totally different. You know, um, what I have experienced and heard over and over is that it adds layers of richness and depth and understanding to everything we've ever thought about ourselves. 
So yes. it, yeah. and, and including things that didn't make sense before. So it, you know, it opens up awareness and understanding not, uh, it doesn't tend in my experience to, um, to complicate in a negative way, uh, the ways we've been conceiving of ourselves. It just gets bigger. It gets bigger and more profound in terms of the way we can see our path and yeah. how something like our time and place of birth might be just one factor that gave us a trajectory that helps us enact our true will and that but you know there's plenty of other things that made that possible too our our parenting or uh, the culture we grew up in the uh, particular uh, teachers we had that unlocked certain capabilities for us and and all of those things um may have been conscious awarenesses in us as we approach knowledge and conversation but then it's a whole other level where we we kind of pull back the camera and say oh that's what all that was about and how i had to go through that really shitty period in my life to be shaped to to be stronger in this way and that's what i had to use for the next stage of growth and you know it, it all starts to make much more sense totally yes <laughs> man yeah uh i definitely agree i think that so when this happened for me it filled in all the little blanks and things I was wondering about, because prior to that experience, I could look at my chart and say, okay, I, I think I get it. But after that experience, it's like, I totally get it. I totally get it. I see it all plain as day. It all makes sense because it ties everything together. I think that when you're looking at astrology or numerology, those being the two heavy hitters in this area, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, you're looking at a coding language essentially. Now, now, that is not an endorsement of simulation theory. Uh, and to, to clarify my stance on this, because people ask me a lot and I write about it a lot, um, I do not necessarily believe that we are living in a simulation. I believe that you can describe reality through those terms in a way that is very easy for people to understand and effective. But that's not to say that I believe it as objective fact. So just to clarify my stance on that. But I think that when you're looking at astrology or numerology, you're looking at something akin to a coding language. But then when you have this experience, and it doesn't, maybe it's not the experience of your holy guardian angel, maybe it's simply your first contact with spirit in general, mm -hmm. which is another thing I'm about to ask you about. <laughs> you're, you're getting something more akin to human understanding, and not not machine mm -hmm. understanding. You're getting something in words. You're getting something with emotion behind it. You're getting something with with feeling that is deeply personal and aimed right at you, and isn't simply a map. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And another thing you said about your own path mirrors mine, and also what I've seen a lot of people go through with this is there's definitely a before uh, and after when it comes to yeah. the HGA experience, and I think it's a pretty common. Uh, life path observable life path to see someone's real the, the real flowering of their life's work happen after the experience yes. um yeah. like you said all these things that you've done since you had that experience really have defined what you've become as a person it sounds like or you know really been a flowering exactly. of that and anything anyone would have defined more, myself by my job prior to that uh -huh. i would have said uh -huh. i work as a chef that is who i am Prior to that experience, I would have leaned heavily, I'm not even a chef anymore, uh, leaned heavily on that career path that I had chosen as, yeah. and, and would have been somewhat lost in defining myself otherwise. And now I can say exactly who I am and what I'm here to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's not to cook food. Um, <laughs> and and, and any, anything that people know me for, any writing, any public you know, talks or the podcast or anything else, um, Living Philema podcast. Um, it all happened after uh, knowledge and conversation. So that's it, clearly it opens a door to uh, to living out the self in the world in a way that simply wasn't there before. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're going to jump back just a little bit here right. because we skipped over something I wanted to talk about. It ties into everything else we're talking about. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so one thing I would say about this conversation with the HGA, if you have it and you can recognize it, that's important, is mm -hmm. profoundly different than any other form of spirit contact you may have. Yes. It is much louder. It, it yes. is much, um, it hits you much harder. Now, I want to talk about the Goetia 
I don't want to talk about AWOS. <laughs> was okay. AWOS Alistair Crowley's HGA? Or was it Rose's HGA? Or was it just another spirit entity? Or the much more popular theory, was it a gray alien? <laughs> um, well, obviously it's the latter. No, I think, um, I think, uh, first of all, I, I'm not going to wade into the territory of what it was because, of course, I couldn't possibly say what I was, right. is, or was. Uh, but um, interpreting Crowley's, the arc of Crowley's understanding of all of these things, it appears that uh, he believed I was uh, an external entity that. Um, was in fact his HGA, but also happened to be the herald of the new Aeon, so dictating the book of the law and, and so on. Um, the arguments about Crowley versus Rose and all of that, uh, that's even harder because it's two people's subjective interpretation of what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I may disappoint you with with not answering this very, very... Um, I think you would uh, disappoint me more by having an objective answer. To be honest, it's, it's a <laughs> yeah. bit of a trick question. I under, but yeah, yeah. But how else do you you gotta ask it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I speaking of iOS though, I think people do uh, glitch a little bit. Like for example, in Crowley's instruction of the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, uh, he recommends that you vibrate the name iOS at the heart as you're coming down the Kabbalistic cross. Um, and since IOS has been talked about as Crowley's HGA, some people get to that stage of training and are thinking, why am I using the name of someone else's HGA at my heart? Um, and that's, um, first of all, that's it's an initial stage of training. And the intention is to, uh, as, as I think was Crowley's, I think I can... Um, speak to that um the intention is to link into the thelemic current itself through the entity that purportedly dictated the book of the law so um in placing ios at the heart it's a way of helping the aspirant link to the thelemic current until such time as they receive the name of their own hga in which case that replaces ios so um this is our teaching today in, in AA and Temple of Silver Star. And um, it's, it's a sense it was kind of uh, pretty fundamentally related to the question of who or what is IWAS. I thought I'd speak to that for a minute. So I would, so now I would personally view it. I'm not, and I'm, this, this isn't an argument. Um, just so my way of thinking is that by, by vibrating at that frequency, yeah, yes, of course, you're, you're, you're trying to link to the flame current, but I would also say that you're linking to the plane at which AWAS exists, which would sure, probably sure. be the same plane at which your own HGA exists if they all exist in, I, I mean, I would lean towards the astral being that, that particular plane, that, that would be my, and I don't know that, I'm saying that I think that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I I don't disagree with anything you said. I, I think uh, there is a, a uh, there's a key to get into a certain state of receptive consciousness to uh, other levels of of mind. Um, Kabbalistically, we might say that the uh, I'll just to oversimplify it quite a bit. Say that uh, you know the HGA lives in the absolutic world. And, and the Briatic world is the, the place of meeting where the, the world of Bria impinges on the adept center of consciousness at Teferith, and that's where that marriage happens with the knowledge and conversation, where the consciousness, the lower human consciousness of the adept is united with the, the Briatic consciousness of the HGA. Um, but that's just another more technical way of saying what I think you're getting at, which is something like vibrating iOS at the heart gets us in the right place, gets our head in the right place to, uh, mm -hmm. to connect with higher force. Yeah. And I think it's akin to the way that um, Buddhist monks will ohm in, in an attempt to vibrate mm -hmm. their pineal gland again, to, yeah. to put you in that particular state of consciousness, because that's a very yeah. real thing. And, and this is where I'm coming into this sort of 
middle ground between a, a person like yourself and a person well not this is our first conversation i, I don't mean to characterize you but you know what i mean a uh, person who i see I like you. <laughs> well and and like peter um who, you know peter j carroll who wrote lee Renell, which is you know to me it was a book that one of the magical books that really changed my life i i find myself in the middle of of you guys um I believe that there are some objective things happening within the spiritual realm that, that can be sort of said, okay, look, this is, this is common among so many practices. There's something really going on here. Astrology being one of them, the hermetic principles being one of them, the idea of these different states of consciousness. And even in fact, Peter agrees about that one, um, you know, or, or is it, is it all imagination and the power of imagination, right? It's, I'm somewhere in the middle of that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's the reasonable place to end up with it, you know. I, I and this is a theme we've touched on several times in this conversation. Mm -hmm. that you want an openness uh, of of a system or training or, or tools that you're using, so that you can you can sort of discover your own truths in that. Um, and it won't matter if someone in some book says, here's what this means or not, because you'll know what it all means to you, you know, and it, that's the key. I think that word meaning is so important here because I believe, like you're saying, that what it means to you will be completely personal. So we, mm -hmm. a lot of people, when I have people come to me for tarot readings, a lot of their first question is, I am surrounded by let's say this particular type of, of uh, I see butterflies everywhere I go. What does it mean? And I say, yeah. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you what that means because what it means is deeply personal to you. You have to discover what it means. I can help you discover what it means to you, but I cannot tell you what that means because right. there isn't one objective meaning sure. for butterflies. It, 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 it is based on so many different things. But I'm, but I, as I progress as a magician, I move further away from the it's all the power of imagination model more into there's something really solid happening here. And I find myself kind of going that way a little bit more and more, which yeah. brings me kind of back to and forward to my next question, which is, and I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm reluctant to even touch this thing at this point, but this book. <laughs> Okay, yes. and specifically this edition of it, which has the forward by Crowley, because they don't all have yeah. this, contains a, a bit that I've read out loud on this podcast before, but I will do it again, despite the consequences. <laughs> it's be a long night with those comments. <laughs> yes. Um, you'd think I would, I would have the page marked, and yet I don't. I can probably recite it at this point, but okay, I, you know, I'll just go ahead and say it. Um, Crowley writes in this in this forward to the Goetia that the spirits of the Goetia are portions of the human brain, and that the names of God are vibrations used to control first the the mind in general, then specific parts of the brain. Okay, I think I did a pretty good job of paraphrasing that. That seems deeply real to me. Well, at the same time, and I'll say the reason I'm reluctant to even touch this book at this point, if you go back and watch the very first episode of this show, I was doing, uh, I spoke to Travis McHenry, who created um, the Occult Tarot Deck, which is a Goetic Tarot Deck. And the first time I spoke to him on the phone, I hung up the phone and my fire alarm went off. The second time I spoke to him on the phone to tell him that my fire alarm went off the first time, I hung up the phone and my fire alarm went off again. And I got it on video. It's in the first episode. A couple of weeks ago, about a month ago now, I was I was having a Zoom conversation like this with my girlfriend because she lives five out five hours away, and I was like saying, "Oh, hey, I have this book that's haunted, and you probably shouldn't touch it." <laughs> and then she's like, "You just touched it." I'm like, "Yeah, I know." And then a few, you know, maybe ten minutes goes by. We're talking about other stuff, and her, her she goes a little white, and I'm like, "What's going on?" She's like, "Who's that behind you?" And it, that kind of thing is so common anytime I open or touch or talk about this book. And so I, I tend to tell my students, like, don't go there yet. Let's get through all this other stuff first, because now I've never had a, any kind of malicious experience, never anything 
bad, negative, just since it's spooky. Yeah. So yeah. can you speak to this and, and what, what do you think is going on here? Well, I don't have any particular uh, negative or, you know, uh, cautionary advice about the Goetia, except um, specifically, um, except um, it's very important to remember that the whole point of, to me, uh, it seems, and I, and I think Crowley would uh, agree with this, the whole point of any magical tool, any evocation, any work of any sort in magic is to strengthen the tools that build that, that enable us to move toward knowledge and conversation of the HGA because that unlocks the true will. And that's the point you know, to, to be living in a world doing what we're here to do in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the real danger is getting sidetracked or distracted by rabbit chases into I need to invoke these particular spirits to get this particular thing to happen and, and getting drawn into that as a kind of a mundane um a, a too mundane game about the, the physical world that we live in um as opposed to building tools of communication with the universal mind in its various forms so the spirits of the goetia understood as um whether you understand them as as parts of the mind as crowley originally put in that introduction or the the parts of the mind that open us up to specific aspects of consciousness that are bigger than the mind um you know there we are back to that either or both question uh in any case i think we um we've got to remember that the point of the the tools is to train ourselves for knowledge and conversation and in terms of the dangers of What I see more than anything else in terms of people getting off track is inexperienced magicians messing with tools too early in their uh, work as magicians, feeling like they've gone off track, invoked something or evoked something they can't banish, or they've been changed in a way they don't like, or something's attacking them, or, you know, those those sorts of uh, fears, and then they overcompensate in some other way, and the next thing you know, they're bouncing around their magical work like a ping pong ball without a, a center. And so, oh I think as long as someone has found a way to move toward their center and has has got some basic communication there, and this is kind of a higher self thing, like a, my everyday consciousness in touch with the deepest part of me, you know, Jung would call it the ego self axis, you know. That the that if we've started to forge that in a way that we can come back to a well we can drink from reliably, then we'll be centered and protected in the most important ways. And then when we experiment with tools, they won't tend to obsess us or knock us off or or make us feel like we've made a misstep. And if we do make a misstep, we don't overreact to it. You know, we bring ourselves back to the center. I hope that makes sense. It makes so much sense. I, I fully agree. I think that so now I don't personally have I I can't I don't know if I can say ever uh because I can't exactly recall. I make so I have done one or two rituals in my 20 years of doing this that were aimed at either the jinn or the goetic spirits, which I believe mm. essentially to be the same system with different names uh that's another thing people could argue about if they want to if you do it sure. argue in the comments but <laughs> uh very very rarely have i done that and very rarely also have i done any magic aimed at the abrahamic uh angels and this is this is largely yeah. because i prefer like aesthetically prefer paganism it, it's just mm -hmm. And, and pagan ar uh, archetypes of gods and, and pantheons it's just always been my aesthetic preference uh, i had a a very negative experience at a church when i was uh, younger after my father died and it turned me off to the entire everything to do with it essentially sure. um but as a student of magic i'm i'm more willing to go look in that direction now yeah um anyways so what i've come to so okay 
you are a, uh, a practicing psychologist. Um, you are a scholar of these things. So I'd like to present to you, if, if you're willing, um, my idea about this and let, you can tell me if I'm totally off base or if I'm not going on the right track. Would that be okay? Okay. Sure. Okay. So what I see is a correlation between what Crowley said, astrology and Sigmund Freud. I see the, the conscious, the super conscious or the ego, the, the super conscious and the id. And I see the sun, moon and rising sign in astrology. And I have a different take on this than most astrologers do. I would say that your sun sign is more representative of the higher self, which, or the HGA, which I would put in the category of, not to say the same thing as, but the category of the superconscious. I would say that your ascendant sign, your rising sign is far more akin to your ego, your, your earthly self. And then the moon sign, I think we all can recognize as the subconscious. That one's pretty well established. So when I look at the this particular pantheon i'm seeing the holy guardian angel as the super conscious i'm seeing the 72 angels of the Sem shemhem farash being a part of that conscious ego and the spirits of the goetia being the archetypes essentially of the id of the subconscious of the that part of ourselves that is much harder to control mm. okay okay um i think there's a, there's that resonates with with a lot of things that that seemed true to me. Um, I think um, the only thing I'd be cautious about is is describing all of that in a, in a limiting way, so that the the for example the the human unconscious mind I think has a lot of elements that don't necessarily link to this or that going experience or something. But I think if you want to locate certain classes of beings uh, in uh, the aspect of human consciousness where they kind of this their home territory i think you're you're hitting at something pretty useful there that uh you you know to to see the let's call them the lower spirits that uh, um that individual um spirits or demons or whatever word you're using um certainly fit more with those aspects of human unconsciousness that uh are more primal and less developed less um Less certainly less conscious, less uh, evolved, and uh, and as you go into other classes of beings, whether that be the the seventy two angels or uh, you know you start looking at uh, in the Hebrew hierarchies of angels and archangels and, and so on, uh, on up to the divine names, you start to move up into more exalted aspects of of human consciousness itself, placing the the HGA more like a, a super conscious role um, makes a lot of sense, of course. So yeah, I, I you know basically liking what I'm hearing. I, I just think that there's there's room in that for a lot of other things too. You know, I agree. When one of the things that I struggle with um, in this sort of like I don't know if I'm gonna call it a theory. This is just the way that I kind of see things and the way that I like to explain them. However, if you read through the goetia and read through the descriptions of the the spirits or demons whatever you prefer to call them um many of them are performing functions which we would ascribe to the conscious mind like teaching logic rhetoric and mathematics right those i would ascribe as functions of the conscious mind so if if i am right then i'm also wrong <laughs> and that you know that's that's interesting and so it, the only thing it really makes me think is that if i if, if i'm going to continue to use this model as as something that i'm i'm pushing as I believe there to be something here. I would I would say that the subconscious mind, the id, um, has those functions. It just does not express them the same way that the left brain brain hemisphere conscious thinking mind. Not that it doesn't have those capabilities. That they're expressed very differently. Another way that I tend to like to explain this to my clients, especially when I'm trying to explain. Um, some of the things that they may be going through energetically and magically, spiritually, is that you cannot think your way out of this. And here's why. Your, your conscious thinking mind, if you are a genius, and I mean a true genius, is about as smart as a pocket calculator, right? I mean, I don't know anybody who can nine, add nine numbers together at the same time. Not a single person who can do that with their 
conscious thinking mind. However, the right, right. brain hemisphere, the subconscious mind is doing much, 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 much more complicated math than that all the time. It has to, otherwise you would fall apart. Sure. And, and, you know, that's the part of the human mind that's more, most deeply intertwined with autonomic functions of the body, all the things that keep us alive. And, and it's doing it in a way that shows that kind of body wisdom that our conscious mind could not possibly um, manage. You know, it's no, it's for, like, for example, you can't, you can't instruct your hair to stop growing. You, you can't do that. You, yeah, you can't. Yeah. You know, if we could do those things, I mean, that'd be incredible. And and there's an argument made to be uh, there's an argument to be made about Wim Hof and his work and accessing those functions of the mind, which is incredibly cool. But I certainly can't do it, uh, and I don't want to take ice baths, so <laughs> I don't think I'll ever gonna be able <laughs> I to most do it. Certainly don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my my boss in my day job is all about it, and he's good at it, and he'll just like jump right in, and he's like, "Come on, guys, do it." <laughs> it's nope, not for me, not yet. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> Okay. Um, anyways, so thank you for answering that. It's something I've been wanting to sure. ask a person like yourself for a very long time. So I, I really appreciate you you offering me your, your perspective there. Um, of so we're we're kind of running out of time, um, unfortunately. But I, I I still have so many more questions for you. Um, let's find a way to wrap this up that that would leave the listeners with something um, to hold on to. So if you could describe just as an overall arching sort of thesis here, what, what do you think the benefits of the, of the Crowley system are in con contrast to other systems of magic? Why, why was this the choice for you? And um, why would you recommend it to others? And, and by the way, just to throw this plug in there also like, yeah, get this book. It's fantastic. It's the only book on Crowley, Thalema, or or this whole topic that's ever really held my attention and made me want to read the whole book, right? Like if I were to pick up uh, this one, I, I've never once in my life finished this book, and I've had it clearly for a very long time. I, it, it's very difficult. Um, this one, again, great book, some great ideas in there, but oh my gosh, <laughs> your book is very readable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. I certainly that was my aim. Um, because I think that all this is very approachable. It's just easy to feel like it isn't when you're reading um, certain Crowley source materials uh, and and some more than others. Um, I think, of course, knowing Crowley, the, the the central issue there is the assumptions he was making about the familiarity of any given reader with all of the stuff that uh, he was familiar with. He he was not, I think, especially good as uh, as an instructor of beginners. And um, I, you know, thirty years later, I still look back and and um getting new things out of some of those source texts that I read many times over the years, but um, still realizing that, uh, oh, that's what he was getting at. So, you know, it, it's one of those unfolding things that you'll always discover more. But in any case, the I think the the value of the system for me, for me personally, start with that, uh, was that I, I was at the, that time in my life, as early, early mid-20s, um, looking for a way to approach a path of mystery inner inner life mystery spiritual connectedness but i wasn't ready to say that i uh i certainly wasn't going to go back to to the religion of my upbringing or anything like that i was kind of raised in the middle of the road methodist you know um, but i needed to find a system that had enough room in it for all of the mysteries of the human consciousness and all of the unexplainable aspects of, of self in the world. And really Carl Jung was the gateway for me. Um, through Jung, I found Rigardi and through Rigardi, I found Crowley. Uh, so that whole world of the overlap of psychology and magic was, was my doorway in. Um, but once I started really diving into Crowley's system and working in it, um, I realized kind of what I've been saying in response to some of your questions today, that that 
there are milestones that are really useful, but there's also so much room for, for us to discover ourselves in it, uh, to really um, uh, unlock those those doors where the keys are the only ones we could find. And what Crowley's done is what I think is a brilliant job in, this, in the structure of the system of AA of providing a set of tools without too much attached doctrine and dogma, letting people experiment with them. And uh, if it's competently run uh, as an organization, uh, something like the AA or Temple of the Silver Star can help people um, not fall into pitfalls, not reinvent the wheel if they don't have to, uh, know that someone who's been through what they're doing and, and experiment with the same tools is helping them experiment with the tools. Um, and I don't know what my life would be if I hadn't done this. Uh, I, I don't, I can't imagine that I would have found myself, uh, found myself to be the human I am if I hadn't walked this path. I'm sure you could argue that some other path might have unlocked similar things, but uh, certainly doesn't feel like it. And so what I, what I see in individuals who commit to this work uh, and and work with it diligently through all the crappy times and the dark nights and so on. Um, the reward is that you become yourself in a richer way than than you've ever dreamed possible. And what you bring to your life, the people in your life, the world around you, uh, is so much richer and deeper because of that. Uh, so, you know, fundamentally, that's the point to me that the system seems to be reliably st structured so that a well-meaning individual who's diligent can completely overhaul themselves um, and uh, and make the world a better place. It's, it's ultimately to me about that service. Again, David, what a fantastic response. Um, I, if I feel exactly the same way um, about teaching magic in general, uh, about, about any path that leads you to that sort of contact with your true will um, or with, with the spiritual aspects of reality, with the spiritual aspects of yourself. And in fact, that is my entire mission through my school, through this show, through everything I do yeah. is to help people to the extent that I can to alleviate some of the mental health crisis that I feel that we are going through as a as a species and a tremendous amount of that crisis being caused by the disconnection between the spiritual aspects of reality and the physical aspects of reality um so any way in which you can help a person get there is an extremely noble cause um i'm all for it and i think your work is fantastic um now that being said okay this is one last question final question sure. And this is another one that people will argue about all the time. <clears throat> Do you feel that Crowley was successful within his own system? Mm. In terms of personal attainment? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think he, I think his, there, let's not take this too seriously, but I do sometimes like to posit that, um, you know, what if the real point of uh, Crowley's system is, as demonstrated by his life, that you construct your own reality so efficiently that you find yourself to be at the center of the cosmos and heralding a new and of human consciousness uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that portrays you as the, the prophet figure of an entire movement. Uh, now, that sounds crazy. But if 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 uh, if the point of the system is to um, to unlock the real center of each person's being, then wouldn't uh, wouldn't a uh, uh, a good demonstration of that be uh, for someone to have founded a system that uh, holds them uh, in their as their attained self at at its center? Um, so. That's just one way of, of looking at it, but I think um, I think what Crowley did demonstrates of knowledge and conversation uh, demonstrates the the 
the the world changing possibilities when someone crosses the abyss and attains to uh, that kind of transpersonal, transhuman level of consciousness, um, and builds and cultivates a system for for promulgating that, propagating that. Um, obviously, in his lifetime, he was reviled and you know that whole you know wickedness man in the world stuff from the twenties and, and so on that never mm-hmm. really. Uh, he never really escaped that um, in his lifetime, and still, you know, obviously. Um, but if we if we look at um, what he was able to to systematize and leave behind, and the depth of his thought about all these things, I, I, that seems like the fruits of an adept and a master to me. That has nothing to do with his personality, his human character, his uh, life choices, or stuff like that. It's it's. Uh, it's kind of like evaluating the art um, rather than focusing too much on the biography of the artist. Yeah, I agree. Um, I do feel that, you know, and this is, this is a difficult one because we weren't there, right? He died in the 1940s. Um, But through what I understand of, of his history, you know, towards the end of his life, he had fallen apart uh, a bit um, or, or was, you know, he's using, uh, more substances and kind of, I mean, like I said, I don't know, cause, cause all this, I don't have any reliable sources on this, right? Yeah. We have the internet and we have what we read. Um, but I would say that there's purpose. If that's true, let's say that, that towards the, the end of Crowley's life, you know, he wasn't doing so great. He, uh, he went off the deep end a little bit. Like if we start from that assumption point, even there, there could be something really beautiful in that you can create a system that helps thousands of people throughout time and that you, it doesn't make you infallible in in any way, shape or form. Right. And I do believe my personal belief and, and I I typically do not like to moralize at people is something I avoid, but my personal belief is that if you want to be successful within any magical system, you, there has to be a, a weight and balance where you, you temper that, Yes, I am the uh, the center of my own universe with humility and with uh, right. appreciation for all things greater than you, and also with a real like. And, and again, this is part of alleviating mental health crises, and and part of which I think are caused by cognitive dissonance. Like we have to strive to be good people. We we really do, or we can, or magic can mess you up, <laughs> and that's that's something I've witnessed. Yeah, I mean, and that speaks to the the encouragement of people to be psychologically balanced as they approach their magical work and to and to have that as a part of their magical work we certainly do in temple of the silver star my teacher fellow secular was very focused on uh sora merrill was very focused on uh, psychological balance regardy so on mm-hmm. but um yeah it's um In, in thelemic terminology and cosmology, what we're talking about is the distinction between the Hadith point of view and a Nuit point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hadith is that point of view that is uniquely individual, and everything is seen through that lens. So that's the sort of individual I'm going to attain, and you know I'm the center of the universe kind of consciousness. The Nuit consciousness is that holistic. Uh, I'm one with everything kind of uh, awareness and it's the it's the interplay between those two that brings the real fruits of the work that allows us to see how we're we're godlike created beings in our individuality but also we're just a star in the heavens like all the others and, and of no uh, uh no better or worse than than any other star uh, and um there is humility in that, as you said, to use your word. Um, there's also there's the power uh, on, on the Hadith perspective. I guess I wanted to, to comment quickly on Crowley's life, end of life mm-hmm. stuff that you were noting. Um, yeah, of course, for those who don't know, he had asthma and had uh, heroin prescribed originally for, for asthma. Uh, he did a lot of experimentation voluntarily with all kinds of substances, but... Um, but his health was worsening physically toward the end of his life, yeah. for sure. And the addiction was part of that. But if you look at his output, his letters, uh, the letter, the books 
that he authored toward the end of his life, say the last decade or so. Um, to me, those don't those aren't fall apart kind of books. Those and correspondences those show someone who's actually um, more deeply rooted in the spiritual truths he was he was seeking all along, and more able to leave his ego outside the door and try to communicate something of value to his students. I, I see more compassion and more humility, more um, the, the kind of wisdom of older age where you realize what, what a shithead you were when you were 25, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. You see more of that in his later work. So I, I actually think he, he, um, he, he was falling together psychologically, even though physically he was not doing well. That's very interesting. Can you um can you actually make a recommendation for something to read from that time period? Uh, it, the best biography of Crowley that I've ever encountered is in my friend uh, Richard Kaczynski's book called Perdurabo. Uh, pretty definitive. Um, I was with Richard last night, actually. <laughs> he lives here in, in North Carolina. Um, but uh, that that's a, a wonderful biography for anybody who really wants to to get that knowledge uh from somebody who's in who's working crowley's systems so it's not a complete outsider but he's also richard is also not um uh, you know going to gloss over the ugly bits and, and mm -hmm. so um yeah i could hardly recommend that bar if you prefer to rob him. okay fantastic i will link that in the description as well as uh links to your works and your podcast your youtube channel uh all of that and i think that's a great place to to end this oh look at, look at that we're going to end right at 11 11. fantastic um <laughs> okay uh david thank you so much this has been uh enlightening and wonderful conversation I, I really can't thank you enough for being on the show well very happy to be here and, and i was really enjoying the the different kinds of questions that you were posing today as, as was your mission at the beginning, I think. So it's very refreshing to, to go in, in different places. So thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Bye everybody. Cut. Oh man. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> well, glad, glad that that uh, fits the bill. Yeah. I enjoyed that. And, and uh, um, like I said, it, it it is, you've probably heard at least one or two of my other interviews, but it does tend to go to, how did you first get interested in Thelema? What is Thelema about, for those who don't know? You know, So it was great to, to go into some more technical zones. And uh, Cool. Um, I I thank to, thank I you for, I know I didn't give you any warning. So, but, 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 but yeah. I mean, I feel like this went, I, 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 this was better than I was hoping for, honestly. Okay. Um, so good i you know after reading your book i had no doubt that i would just be able to ask you the questions and you would know you would have an answer <laughs> i didn't think you were gonna uh have to say oh, i want to go get my notes or anything like that you clearly know what you're talking yeah, yeah. about and you know just, yeah i think that the best podcasts the most captivating ones are, are not scripted in any way oh, sure. you know yeah. I, and 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 the downside to that is that i forget stuff like i forget to plug my own mystery school in the intro <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean, that's fine. I think that people need to get used to that because if they do attend my program, they're going to realize it's just me ranting for an hour once a week and they pay for it. Right. <laughs> but, you know, um, they, they seem to well, enjoy you're it. Ranting with wisdom. That's, that's the good thing about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like um, a channeling state, you know, when, you, when you're is, talking passionately yeah. about something. Yeah. Yeah. I, this, that's one of the most, HGA things, you know, that happens in everyday life is is during uh, teaching or therapy sometimes when, like when conducting therapy, uh, that uh, you just you feel like something's talking through you, and and it's um, at least that's my experience of it. It's mm -hmm. it's not just I'm formulating thoughts and this is you know this linear path of what I'm going to say. It's um, something that starts to, to shine a little bit that is really bigger than us and uh but but also us uh, yeah i love yeah that. exactly it's something something comes through you that and, and i've said this a number of times on the show as well like that i can tell the difference between 
spiritual wisdom that's that's given to me and my own thoughts because when when it's given to me in that way it comes through in a way that's poetic i'm not poetic it comes through in a way that is that has metaphors that i then need to spend time unwrapping uh, mm-hmm. it, it comes through in layers in in you know so many layers that, that it's not apparent to me right away oh man something i forgot uh to even mention during the the pro you know the recording um when you were talking about uh being given you know crowley being given the name awas so gosh i would love to do a part two because there's so much more to talk about here but part of my experience again having not gone through anything crowley related at all this is a number of years ago was i was given a mantra which contains the name of my hga which uh if you don't mind me sharing with you came through as enki which is one of the sumerian uh gods and I still don't know what it means because it's in Sumerian. And I don't know anybody who speaks Sumerian. I believe it's in Sumerian. It's very clear. I've written it down a million times, but I, but I can re- I know the sound of it. And if I go into a meditative yeah. state, repeating it in my mind, I can get there. But I don't know what the words mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Crazy. That reminds, reminds me of some of my experiences with, uh, I, I did a book called The Winds of Wisdom, which is my results of scrying the, 30 Enochian Aethers, uh, mm-hmm. like Crowley did with Vision and the Voice. And one of the things that happened with that is that I I was, you know, when in the in the vision, things were said to me in Enochian. And I don't I'm not fluent in conversational Enochian. <laughs> I studied the language, but uh without translating it, which I eventually did, I wasn't going to know what it meant. But when you get things like that where there's no way your conscious mind could have formulated something that makes sense. In some language you don't know and then later you go yeah. back and it's poetry in another language you know that's one form of verification that this is uh, there is something uh objective about this one metaphor by the way i went to lay on you and i'd love to do part two uh, to say more like stuff like this but um like the the essence of the thing is like a a coat rack <laughs> you know like the, there's something about a, a particular spirit's nature um, or an archetype in Jungian terms, it's like potential. And there's so there's this coat rack with a peg on it. And that peg is there for everyone. But everyone comes with their own thing to hang on in it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's that objective part that's always there and is universal and everyone finds it. But the what where that ends up looking based on our own material that we hang on it could be so individualized that sometimes we miss that there's something objective anyway that's just a right i totally agree way that works i know i've got to go to work but i just one last thing last thing I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, i've got to work this week on a saturday because i gotta uh, anyways but okay i digress Sorry um about that. that was perfect and i'm going to remember what you just said because while Peter Carroll would say nothing is true. Everything is um, everything is permitted, which is a, a mm. axiom of chaos magic. Mm. I would say that the coat rack is true. <laughs> like the coat hanger yeah. is true, but the coat is uh, completely up to your imagination. Uh, and and Hagen von Tullian, uh, who's also a friend of Peter's, who I've had on the show a couple of times, he's described it as like you you have a gift. The gift is the gift, but how you wrap it, totally up to you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah, I like it too. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I've got to go. We could talk forever. So, no <laughs> but I've got to, got to go to work. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Um, I'll shoot you an email. Uh, we'll talk about links and send me a photo for the thumbnail yeah. and all that. Usually, I have these up about a week from today. I, I'm hope to have it okay. f- uh, posted to YouTube and Spotify. Okay. Yeah. Just let me know what you need, and I'll I'll get it to you. Awesome. Okay. Thanks again, David. Talk to you later. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.